Welcome to the Master's Certificate in Technical Analysis. My name is Stu Wisson and we've reached Module 7. And I trust that you're all learning a lot from the previous modules about trends and averages. But now we're looking at something a little bit different. In Module 7 Part 1 we're going to be looking at oscillators and also in this module we'll look at sentiment indicators. But oscillators are a little bit different from what we've looked at before because what we've looked at before, like moving averages, where they've pl plotted on the price charts, and in this part one of module 7, we'll look at oscillators, which are usually either plotted beneath the price chart, or you'll just have to refer up vertically to where it is on the chart, and what it's referencing to. Oscillators, as the name suggests, go up and down, they oscillate between extremes and they do indicate overbought and oversold conditions. These are terms we use quite frequently. It is a rational enthusiasm, if you like. When it's overbought, the people have gone on and on buying until the stock is pushed up by demand to somewhere that's not sustainable. And oversold is the opposite. When everybody is rushing to get out of a share, because they see the price is going down, so there's a tendency to go too far and let it go to any price and then we'll say that the shares are oversold and they're likely to turn around and start becoming a little more valuable. So that's what overbought and oversold mean. Basically it's an extreme irrational enthusiasm and basically it means it's gone too far. Oscill oscillators also can be used to indicate a loss of momentum before you see it before you see it in the price there's a certain momentum to a trend to an uptrend or to a downtrend the thing is going along and under its own steam and with an oscillator you get an indication that the steam is losing pressure and before you see it happening just by looking at the price charts alone a more important point to make is that oscillators really are secondary indicators. They are not really prime trading factors. They have to be supported by looking at other things on the chart. Basically, trend analysis is where you start. You don't start by looking at an oscillation and saying this is over, that is overbought or oversold and I'm going to trade. You start by looking at the chart, looking at the prices, and seeing if there's a trend that supports that idea, and then going back to that indication, to that oscillation. Yeah, it's got to that point where it's trading, where, it, where the trade's worthwhile. The other thing you can watch is divergence from price. What I mean by that is that when you're in an extreme position, the top or bottom, as we'll see in, the, in in a moment, and the oscillator line starts coming the other way while the price is still carrying on. That's a sign that shortly the trend is going to change. So beware of diverging from price. But really only applies when you're overextended, as indicated previously by an oscillator. Oscillator usage. We'll look for overextended positions. What is overextended? Well, that's an overbought or an oversold. When that happens, you can say that the price and the trend may be vulnerable and may be about to break down. It gives us an indication. Oscillators can also be misleading because if it's a strong trend and it's just started, the oscillator may go to an extreme position anyway. It does not mean the trend's going to suddenly reverse if it's just started. You just have to look at the price chart and you have to look at the oscillator and you have to see how those two go together. Again, look for divergence in extreme positions. I covered that just now. You have to be in an extreme position and then when the oscillator starts going in the opposite direction to the price, it only indicates that something is going to happen shortly. Another way you can use oscillators is crossing the zero line. Sometimes it's not a zero, sometimes it's just a line in the middle of the oscillator. 
it depends which particular os which particular oscillator you're looking at and whether it's labeled zero or not and when it's crossing the zero line some people take that as an indicator to trade as well some people say you only buy when the oscillator is below the middle and so it's only on an o on on the oversold side and some people say you only go short when the oscillator there is above zero let's look at some particular oscillators there are quite a few and more than I'll ever cover here or in the paperwork you just have to look at your charts but there's an awful lot out there and then you'll see a whole host of oscillators that you can pull up and you'll come up um, uh, and, and you will come to realize that the majority uh, all pretty much operate the same way the first oscillator we're looking at is a simple momentum indicator as it's called that measures the velocity at the price change how fast the price is changing just by plotting the price differences between the current price and the price for a few days ago here's one graph I've got a couple here I've got a 20 day momentum indicator and a 5 day momentum indicator so one of them is plotting the difference between the current day and the 20 days ago and the other one is plotting the difference between the current day and the day five days ago and you can see the five day there's a lot more up and down a lot more volatility you'll find this in general if you're looking at all the different oscillators they're much smoother if you take them over a longer period and then if you want more action you can take them to shorter periods but then of course there's a balance to be struck you don't want them so smooth they hardly ever deviate to give you a signal but again you don't want them jumping up or down so much that you're trading all the time and a lot of the time it's a false start so you have to look at it maybe it's a 20 day 5 day or maybe even a 10 day you have to look at the period you're using anyway back to the momentum indicator as it goes upwards momentum indicator will be above the middle line which in this case shows a hundred and that just means that the price is higher than it was 20 days ago or five days ago if the momentum indicator is rising that means the prices are going up accelerating if the momentum indicator turns out horizontal the prices can still be rising but they are normally but they are only going up in the same rate as they were going 20 or five days ago so when you see a horizontal line you see a less acceleration in the price rise when the momentum indicator is starting to come down prices could still be rising but you're seeing, seeing a slowdown in the trend you're seeing in advance of the price slowdown you're seeing the rate slowdown which means that the trend could be turning so the momentum indicator as with these oscillators, uh, oscillators in general leads the price action remember when we talked about moving averages and that could only lag price action because they are only reporting what happened a few days ago momentum indicators the way they are calculated allow us to lead the price action if we get an indication before the price changes and that's the value of an oscillator now this is a very simple oscillator but many traders will buy or sell when they cross the zero trading with the trend so if your momentum indicator is coming up through the zero then you should buy providing you're in an uptrend and if your momentum indicator goes down through the zero and in this case it's shown as a hundred then you would sell short as long as it's in a downtrend later we'll see some of these oscillators have boundaries lines to show what is high and what is low so we can tell more accurately when we get into an extreme condition momentum indicator doesn't have those put into in automatically we can you see a couple of spikes or a couple of false spikes for the five day momentum indicator at the bottom over the left there there's there there are going pretty high really what you have to do is you could more or less eyeball it you could print it out and draw a horizontal line across to see if you see the peak comes back up to the same level or draw the line below it to see the oversold state really you're eyeballing it or drawing a line on the chart and saying this seems to be an extreme value I'll take it as an extreme and act appropriately because there's no boundaries that are actually on there so there's a very simple indicator the momentum indicator just one price minus another price 
The next is Commodity Channel Index, or CCI. This was just originally, as you can guess from the name, designed from the f for the futures market markets, but it's also an indicator that compares the current price with the moving average of the last X number of days, and then it will normalize the values. So you will have a consistent set of values on it. So let's look at the chart. This is a 20-day CCI, so it takes the 20-day moving average and compares the price to that. And it indicates overbought and oversold. Here we have a zero line in the middle, and we have a 100, and we have a minus 100. And these are significant. You know where, th when, you know when these were invented, it was suggested that you could go along any time the value went over 100 and go short any time the value went to minus 100. It's usually not used like that now. Now, it's usually just said that anything over 100 is overbought, and anything below 100 is essentially oversold. You can see that this is quite an active one, and certainly this chart, uh, uh, as it is in your book, you could have found out if you would have gone along with it by now, went over 100 and gone short when it went below 100, and that would have worked to making a profit. So that was sort of the next development, if you like. And um, we're sort of moving through with an increased sophistication with these oscillators. Next is a relatively well-known one here, the RSI, also basically the Relative Strength Index. That one compares the up closes in a day that's uh, an up day when with the down closes in a day that's a down day. And this again is a sort of smoothing device. The momentum indicators, remember we took away the price from 20 days ago and plotted it. Now, if there's a sudden spike 20 days ago, that would immediately make the chart look funny today by kicking it out. So this is an attempt uh, that from so this is an attempt from making that happen by looking at the closes from the past number of days and smoothing it out on that basis. Now, if we pull up the chart here, we can see that this is a 14-day relatively relatively strength R index RSI. That's quite a common one to use. It has lines for extremities, so anything over 70 is considered extreme and overbought, and anything below 30 is considered extreme and oversold. Now, the thing you should watch, of course, as I've said, is if you have a strong trend, it could produce spikes in the trend. If you don't want to assume that it is overbought, it's going to reverse and become a downtrend straight away. It can bob a long time for a time, and the high overextended value. Another point, if you're in a strong bull market, your extreme line could be more like 80%, so you're looking for it to go above 80% to be overbought in a bull market, and in a bear market, possibly below 20% would be the real extreme indicator. So the RSI is a much used indicator. We move on now to the stochastic oscillator. It compares the closing price with the range of the prices that have happened. So the idea on this one is that if you're in an uptrend and a good uptrend, the closing price is not normally towards the top of the daily range. And if you're in a downtrend and it's a good downtrend, then you'll see mostly that the closing price for the day is towards the bottom of the range of the day. So the stochastic oscillator looks at where the closing prices are in relation to the whole range of prices and generates it from that. Again, this is a very useful oscillator. The one I've shown here is a 14-day and a 3-day slow stochastic oscillator. Now I have to explain, there's a fast stochastic oscillator which is calculated first, and that can be on 14 days for the main line, and the main line here is the solid line, so look at that first. It's a 14-day calculation of the stochastic. Now the second dashed line, which is called the percent D line, is a signal line is a three-day moving average of the first line. So that smooths it out and provides a signal line. Now that's a fast stochastic oscillator. 
what I've got here as I've said in the slow one because what happens there is that that's the signal line the three day moving average is called the slow stochastic indicator line the solid line and then you take a three day moving average again to smooth it out and provide the signal line now I think on this particular chart I think you can see that it says 14 on the chart and in brackets 3 so you can choose how many days you smooth that out by to make it a slow stochastic on this one but usually it's 3 days you'll usually do 14 divided by 3 day 14 by 3 sorry uh, 1 and then 3 day 1 becomes the slow stochastic line and it smooths out that again by 3 days to complete the signal line I hope you follow that it does sound quite complex I can certainly give you more information if you would like it but basically the computers do this for you so you don't really need to know but you need to know what the 14 days the main selection you have on those rules and then the three day smoothing is quite the common number to use now the stochastic has the signal line which is not much use again don't go trading against the trend in general terms you shouldn't trade against the trend but what you do is look for an extreme condition and you look for the dotted line the signal line to be running from the, that condition and crossing over the solid line and when it crosses that signal to do a trade so let's just look at this one in the middle this is extreme in this case we've got 0 to 100 and they're showing the extreme lines at 75 and 25 which is a something again you can choose but this is fairly average sort of thing this is this is one saying here is that here is this is where it's overbought and uh, which would what this one is saying sorry I spit it out what this one is saying here is that this is overbought in the middle here so you're looking for a downtrend to happen sometime and the signal line comes up and crosses through the solid line at this point so you'll be going short at this point up here on the price chart you see that did actually work this is a fairly gradual downtrend but this is a downtrend when you would have made money going short if you go to the middle of August you can see we've over oversold and this dotted line crosses the old line again that's around it about exactly at the middle of August around where the high value bomb is and again that looks like the bottom of the price and the price does run up a few days after that so you would have been okay long on that one although it didn't go very long that's the way you use it you use it when the dotted line crosses your other line and you're in the extreme area that's the basic signal provided you've checked out your basic trend for the sort of signal you're looking for we'll deal with this one quickly the Williams percentile it is very similar it compares the range of closing prices for the day to the range of prices over several days and several days of what you set so it gives you a very similar thing this is actually a 20 day and it looks pretty peaky and you probably don't want to be trading all those ups and downs but again you can play with the rules and get a smoother oscillator if you wanted or use a second oscillator quite often you would also set up an RSI and only trade if both the oscillators said that the price was overextended and that would provide some control to stop random trading and the final type we would like to look at right now is the moving average convergence and divergence indicator which is shorted and most commonly referred to as the MACD and that goes back to basically the crossover method that we looked at in the moving average this is using an exponential moving averages rather than simple and it looks slightly different between the two exponential moving average averages and the simple moving averages and then that's averaged out again to smooth it so what we're really saying is that when you have a crossing of the moving averages before they can cross they have to approach one another and what we're doing here is anticipating the crossing by anticipating the converging by seeing the converging happen we are then getting before the actual crossing so it anticipates the crossing rather than being a lagging indicator again we have the signal line here this is the 61326 MACD with a nine day signal line that's a nine day smoothing out of it so that's the same as a 13 day exponential moving average and a 26 day moving average exponential moving average to make up this line and we can use it in the same sort of way we look for the crossing 
when it's in an extended position and in this one we don't have any lines to show that it's an overextended but what we can see obviously where something is high see here in October that's obviously a high and the signal line crosses providing the chart is looking right that's short and the short would have made that well, the short would have made that about so that's the way that one is used these little green bars they're optional to add on but they they actually just show the difference between the two lines so you can see when the signal line is approaching the MACD line you get smaller and smaller obviously where the green bars are zero that's actual that's the actual crossing but you can get an indicator of where the green line is approaching by the bars getting smaller obviously you can see in December the lines are actually approaching each other because the bars are, bars are getting smaller so you'll get an indication before the actual crossing so again it gives you a little bit more information and prepares you for your trading so in summary the first thing I would say is that, oscillate, is that the oscillator is a secondary indicator you should do your basic trend analysis and not rely on an oscillator to enter a trade without looking at anything else. The oscillator can't by itself justify entering a trade, particularly, particularly not if it's suggesting that you go counter trend. This is because oscillators, they're just calculated to help you understand the trend. They are not by themselves the law so it's a secondary indication and you just have to remember the trend now just going over the oscillation types look for overextended conditions that's where the oscillator is useful you have to make sure that the trend is appropriate as well as for your, you to be considering a trade you look for divergence in the extreme conditions when the oscillator starts coming back and the price is still going up then that's a signal that shortly something is going to happen. And the third thing is what you do with an oscillator is that you look for a zero crossing. It may be, depending on how you look and use the system, it may be a signal to buy. And it's certainly a caution that you should buy when you're above the line and go short when you're below the line. And think carefully when you're outside that. So that's a bit of a long video, but it's basically to show you the different types of oscillators. There are many types of oscillators. They all react slightly differently. But I think I plotted four of them together in this. And obviously, as you can see, they do more or less track each other. Obviously, people keep reinventing oscillators, and they will always do that. But essentially, they all do the same thing. But, the, the, you know, they, they essentially give you the same information. And it's essentially what you feel best works for you. So that's the first part. The second part of module 7 will be shorter, I promise. And uh, basically, we're going to be talking about sentiment indicators. Sentiment are basically a contrary opinion. This is psychological. This has nothing to do with math. In fact, trading, as we've said before, is just not not just a mathematical thing in fact rarely a mathematical thing it's only used mathematically to work out the uh, uh, things like the oscillators and moving averages and so on so if it was and <laughs> believe me this is where a lot of people actually get it wrong if it was just a mathematical thing we would just use computers and every trader and uh, that decided to trade using these things would be very rich and this is where essentially a lot of these black box systems get very wrong because they can't measure sentiment so there's a basically in trading there's an awful lot of psychology in it there's an art as well and there's a, there is a science too and contrary to popular opinion there's a, an expression of that art and that's getting away from figures because it states to the contrary it's not what you would expect in fact, you could say that the contrary opinion is summed up when the majority of people agree they're probably wrong. It's probably something way back, I think it was in 1954, Humphrey Neal wrote The Art of Contrary Thinking. And someone called James, uh, someone called James read that and applied it to trading. And in 1964, he established the market Wayne Advisory Service. 
which was a pole of letters. And the idea there is that traders read investment letters and they tend to believe that they what they read and therefore if you take a poll of what the letters are saying you kind of sum up how traders are thinking. If the letters are saying it's a bullish market, we're shooting to the heavens now, then the traders are thinking, yeah we are. Because the letters because the letter they believe in, and so you'll have a measure of how traders are thinking. So therefore, what they're saying under contrary opinion is that if the general opinion is that the market is very bullish, then that's a bearish sign. If everyone's saying, hey, we're going to go to the stars now, then that's a bearish sign. It's a contrary view. And it's not something I would say you should do all the time, but it's something that you should have to be open to thinking. You don't want to go along with the herd all the time. You want to think it's really uh, you want to think if it's really true and vice versa. If the market opinion is that of its bearish market and it's gone towards the bottom, you won't and won't be going any further down, then that might be a bearish sign and says that the market is going to turn. Now we're not just being contrary for the sake of being contrary, but there are reasons for contrary opinion and how that can work. One is that if everyone thinks it's a bullish market, they're all falling in there. They are all thinking, yeah, I'm going to jump into this boat and increase the value of my portfolio. So they're all putting their money in, so they can spare it if they could spare it, and put in, and that's extremely bullish sentiment. They may be over committing, they may not have any money left because they have probably doled in expected to make lots. So who's left to keep the trend going up? If everyone's pulled their money in, no one is going to buy any more. Surprise, there is no more demand because people haven't got any more money to put in. So what happens when the demand goes down because they don't have any more money to pay for it? So if the demand goes down, the price goes back down. So if it's a bullish sentiment and every everyone is pulling their money in thinking they're going to win, then what happens is that the price goes down. It's going to be a bearish market and vice versa. If everyone's saying it's bearish, my goodness, I'm out of here, it's going to get to a point where it actually reacts in, uh, in a bullish manner. So that's one idea. And for that, you actually need 80% bullish tendency or 20% bearish tendency to say that it's really to that level. But when it gets to that extreme level of sentiment, then there's a reason why contrary opinion might be more sensible choice. There's another reason. Perhaps this applies more to the futures market. The futures market is obviously a zero-sum game. For every long position, there's a short position. And there's people owning both sides thinking they're right. So if someone's bullish, say 80% of the people are long in the bullish market, while there's people on the other side, people in the short position, who have an average of four times as many contracts because they're only 20% short, and they're convinced that they are right. And the chances are that people who hold those contracts are actually very well financed and be able to hold on, whereas if you have a little twitch if the pricing of those people are going long, was the small investors may be forced to liquidate, so they may make it, it turn. So the minority side of the trading is usually the strongest financially, and therefore they can hang on through the fluctuations and market, and the market may turn. Another thing to watch out for, as mentioned in previous modules, are statements of traders' reports, which comes out every week, that tells you in the futures market who's speculating, who's hedging, and you have to watch out for and and you have to watch out for the hedges. The hedges normally are very well financed and if you're going to go with the contrary view you really want to be going against the speculators. Speculators may drop out, may not have the finance. If there are more than 50% hedges that you'll be going against by trading a contrary opinion then you probably you shouldn't. Another way to tell whether you have to go to that point, whether all the bullish people have put in their money um, in that they've got, is to look at the way the news is responded to by that market. So it's a bullish market, and you have some more good news, but the market doesn't do much. That's because the people have already put all their money in there, convinced that it's going to keep going up. 
If the market doesn't go very far, that's a sign that it's got to an overextended position, or bullishness, and that might just turn into a bear market. The same on the other side, obviously, if it's a bearish time and you have some more bad news but nothing really happens, and the prices are not dropping any further, then that may mean that they're overextended in their sentiment. And that's the overextended and the sentiment, and it's time that you can think about contrary opinion and think that maybe the opposite side is the side to be on. Investor sentiment, similar sort of idea, it's actually just the Baron's book I give you. Baron has this thing that comes out each week called an investor sentiment reading, and that'll tell you what percentage of people are bearish, are, are bearish and bullish. And so you get a clue of and so, you <coughs> and so you get a clue there of what percentage of people are looking like. And basically, uh, basically, if you can see that more than 55% of people are bullish, that's bad for the market. It's getting to the point where too many people are thinking that it's going up forever. And then again, if you have less than 35% think the market is bullish, then that's probably too much of a pessimistic view, and it's good for the market, and the market will turn into a bull market. So that's it for sentiment and the contrary opinion. It's a very interesting idea. Trading is all about psychology. Your own psychology in going in and out of trades and taking losses. And of course, the psychology of everyone else in the market. Because they're the people who are moving the market along with you. So it's interesting to think about the psychology and try and second guess everybody. The next module coming up, module 8, we'll be talking about further charting. In fact, we'll be going into detail of candlestick charting, which we mentioned into the first charting module, and also point and figure charting, which we don't use quite as much nowadays. It, was a f it has a very sound and well-used method, and it's still in use by a lot of people. Point and figure charting is charting that doesn't actually have a regular time scale. And by doing that, it places more emphasis on the actual trends. And we may touch also on a couple of other types of charting. So that's coming up in Module 8, and I look forward to talking to you then. Goodbye for now.